wait so after the survey results about your feet have you done a barefoot episode? Uh, no, but I wore sandals and I'm figuring that... What's the point of the survey? Variety. It's one of the things you would program into an AI thing that was making subjective judgments about whether it's good. We change things up. We don't do the same thing every week, Stan. But well, you've actually, been doing the same thing. You've been wearing shoes. I know. I have been <laughs> doing the same thing, yeah. Oh, man. So you, do you think you'll do any more barefoot episodes? Yeah, we'll do some more barefoot episodes, and I'd like you to do some barefoot episodes too. We want to shock people. I don't want to be barefoot though. Oh uh, well, that's that's probably why you should do it. I'll do Get a barefoot episode if you do a topless one. Uh, See, we'll have a conversation about this later. <laughs> you can wear a bra if it makes you feel. If we less can naked. do some CGI and use the Arnold Schwarzenegger thing underneath there, I mean the old Arnold. Oh, instead, what is yeah. it called? Fa um, Deep fake. deep fake fake deep, deep fake yeah deep but fake. instead of a face it changes your body yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great yeah. somebody complained about the animation that cody did that it didn't look anything like us did you read that no i didn't see that comment what did they say? I, they said that it, uh, it, it, it didn't, didn't, look, like didn't look anything. I It looks exactly like <laughs> us. <laughs> great. Great burn. <laughs> I think it looks like us too. I don't know what he's talking about. Well, did you want to get in a conversation about that? No, but I think we should change our body positions a little bit. Just change your body position a little bit so that we can superimpose a deep fake image of Cody's cartoon onto your body. Oh, yeah. that's where you're Go going ahead. with that. Yeah, I remember yeah, that idea. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, anyway. Okay. Got enough body movement. Okay. Cool. All right. What do we do today, Stan? Oh, yeah. So, welcome everyone to the Draftman <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> My name is Stan Prokopenko. I'm an art teacher. I'm an artist. And I run Proko.com. And I do some AI stuff on the side. I'm Marshall Vandruff. I am an art teacher as well. And I draw. On the side. On the side. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in this podcast episode. Yes. On this radio show, we are going to be taking some voicemail questions that's the we're just taking a bunch of voicemails i think it's time that we did for the last number of episodes we have dictated the terms of the topic whether you were interested or not and this is the time for you to i think we didn't do a voicemail topic. a few episodes ago yeah so this is repentance yeah yeah so now we're gonna do one with just voice just voicemails let's do it and we haven't heard these no i haven't heard these yeah just so you guys know we Marshall and I don't hear any of the voicemails before they're played to us during all the episodes. It's true. Hey, down, fellas. Love hey. the podcast. My name's Danny. Um, yeah, quick question. Um, myself taught wannabe comic book artist, and I'm wondering how you go about getting a mentor in this day and age. I know it's easy with emails and texts and social media and stuff, but you always hear stories of Alex Toast would take letters from young kids and write back in depth about their work and critique them and do that on an ongoing basis on a monthly basis. I get people's schedules are hectic with deadlines and stuff, but I'm wondering how you go about approaching a professional artist to be a mentor in that capacity. Thanks, guys. Love the show again. Cheers. Bye-bye. So he's this referring to Tim Gula approaching Alex Toth and, and, and saying, I want to be your mentor, and Alex saying yes. I don't know if he was referring to that, but that type yeah. of story, yeah. yeah. Did he say Tim? Maybe. Well, he didn't mention Tim, but he was talking about Alex Toth as a mentor. Oh, he was is, talking yeah, about Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I, th I thought he was. Some students have the audacity to approach even world-famous talent and say, I want you to be my mentor. And the obvious response is, I am sorry, I am very busy. <laughs> yeah. And then sometimes they have the audacity to say, listen to me. You will regret not having me as your mentee. And if you can convince them, then the conviction comes from uh, what's in it for them. So to increase your odds of them saying yes, you have to be mentorable. Good point. You have to be someone that somebody would want to mentor. That means you have to be likable. They don't want to talk to someone who's annoying and 
maybe disrespectful or um, who they don't think even has a chance. Mm-hmm. You know, people have opinions. Mm-hmm. Someone might look at an artist and say, "Yeah, you're you're way you're too far. I can't help you." Mm-hmm. Or they might just think that it's natural for us to think that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and they might just not want to spend put that effort in. But if they see some kid who has the drive and puts in the time and is already showing signs of skill, they might want to get some of that credit yeah. of like, ooh, I can help them out and then they'll give me credit for helping them. Yeah. That's what, that's the part of like, what is it, what's in it for me? Yeah. That's the answer is they'll get credit for, for making you. These stories you tell of, you know, someone getting trained by someone else and then that person looks like a master because they trained Bridgman, you know. Right. Or like who, Bridgman trained Rockwell, right? That, that's right. You know, trained like Rockwell Bridgman and... seems like a god because he he mentored Rockwell. Yeah. You know, you, you so if you are mentorable, then you have a much higher chance of be- getting a mentor. And promising. Is, I, you're, you're talking about being mentorable, but also promising that... Prom- yes, yeah, yeah. mentorable and... Well, that's part of being mentorable, I, I think. Yeah. yeah. You're yeah. worth mentoring. Worth mentoring, yeah. The other thing, though, is paying people. <laughs> if you're not mentorable, you can still pay people to mentor you, which yeah, is you... the a less attractive option. Yeah. But, you know, you can... Uh, there's people on Patreon skilled artists Mm -hmm. who you can pay them a certain amount per month and they will have a Skype session with you once every few weeks or something, whatever they, everyone has a different thing that they sell. I know one is Steven Bauman. Mm -hmm. He's got a waiting list at this point because he's actually a really good mentor. Um, So it's not as easy anymore, but yeah, he has a Patreon where you can sign up, pay him like a hundred bucks a month and, and have a Skype session with him. That's a great deal. Because yeah. if you come to him and you say, hey, mentor me for free, he's going to be like, no, I, I don't have time. I'm sorry. But if you help me buy dinner, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an hour of my time. Yeah. Um, so, that's and the other option. If you are paying a mentor, you are the client. The mentor is in the, the, the supplier. You are uh, interviewing the mentor. You are deciding whether this is worth your money. If you go after someone who is world class, how are you going to pay them enough if their time is worth Stephen $300 Bauman is world an hour? Class. Pardon? He is world class. And, and isn't he's affordable? 100 bucks a month, I think, is for like a... I, I don't want to... Yeah, but that's, that's... You could look at his Patreon, but it is affordable, yes. If he's world class and he's affordable... But he's got a waiting list, yeah. so now it's like... Now it's harder to... Yeah. But yeah, get on the waiting list. What, what? You, you, you mentioned buying dinner. One of the things that you could do, if you've got two or three of you who say, look, we admire this artist. We know this artist's time is valuable, but we will take you to a dinner at restaurant of your choice or a lunch. Restaurant of your choice. If you will give us two hours of time, you can order anything you want. If everybody pitches into it and then you come prepared to ask them the most important questions. <sighs> and if you get someone to do that twice a year, you're getting mentoring. Why, why are you wincing? If someone came to me with that, I would say no. Why? Because then I know I would feel pressured to, to, to give them something back. They bought me dinner. Yeah. It's you, like, you, okay, now I owe you something. You, but you're, the thing you're giving them is your time. I would still feel the pressure okay. that that time wasn't enough. They, I know they're expecting something more than just that one dinner. What if they aren't? What if they're oh, expect- come on. What if they're, because they come to you with a series of questions. Yeah. Say, tell us a story of how you got started. Un- oh, here's another oh, thing. So, Do, that dinner is the mentor is session? Is the mentorship. Yes. Okay. They'd have to pitch it well enough to yes. say that I don't expect anything afterwards. Then I'd be like, okay, now I'm open to it. But pitching to your yeah. mentor is a, is, is a preliminary to pitching to any, any uh, potential client for a project. Yeah. You're, you're trying to convince them. Do not approach a person who you want to mentor you and ask them questions that they have already answered in interviews on the internet that you have not paid attention to. 
Isaac Asimov was asked to be interviewed by a, an interviewer and Asimov asked him a few questions and he told the guy, you do not know my work well enough to get an interview with wow. me. Wow. Because one of the things that becomes tiresome to people in the industry is they get the same question over and over. Yeah. So find out what they've already said, then you can question into the gaps. The, the point that I, Asimov is making is that there needs to be a certain amount of respect for what is already out there. So if you right. respect that and then you come in, not to show your knowledge, but to say, look, we've read everything that you've said, but we've got some questions and you have not talked about these first few jobs. We wanna ask you about that. And then if they give you their time, take it seriously. Yeah. And it was in the early 90s that Justin Sweet wanted to interview me. He was my student at Fullerton Community College. And he sat me down and asked me a series of questions he recorded them and I answered the best I could but I answered for any students that I could a year later uh, a year later he wanted to interview me again and that next year he said last year I asked you this and you said this and he did that several times and I thought everything I answered he took those answers seriously enough to remind me of the exact wording that I did and there was something that clicked in my brain mm -hmm. This guy takes it seriously. And that makes him more mentorable. Indeed. Because you know that all the effort you put in to help this person is worth taking the effort to yes. do so because it will actually help them. Yes. If you think people will not take you seriously and take it for granted, then it's, it's just a waste of time. He told me a decade later that every time I mentioned a movie, every time I mentioned a book, every time I mentioned an author, he wrote it down, which I always noticed that he did. Mm -hmm. But he also, before the internet, used to look those things up and scour bookstores to find that artist. So yes, there are people who are worth mentoring. And this brings up the other thing about uh, teachers, or excuse me, uh, uh, mentors, wanting to mentor you is that when they yeah. see you are going to be a part of history, Aren't you proud oh, that yes. Justin Sweet is one of your mentees? I, I You're am just like, so, yeah. yeah, look at me. Yes, it's like, <laughs> look, I taught him. I am Marshall Vandruff, yes. mentor of Justin Sweet. There is, a, there is a good deal of that. And I've got some, some students now that I feel the same way about. I always, always had students that I feel like this person is going to make a mark on the industry. They're great. And it is a privilege, even at junior college wages, to be playing that role. So, uh, yeah. if you really are seeking a mentor, make yourself attractive as a mentee, and that ca that's going to be the difference between whether you get it or don't. And remember, some of the best artists might be some of the worst mentors. Right. <laughs> that's another top. Let's, you want to move on to the no, next one? Yeah, let's one? move on to the next one. Because that, that, I mean, that's a big one, but... Hi, yes. I actually used to take a class with, with Marshall, and... <laughs> One of the things in regarding to uh, developing your style and uh, choosing your parents, one thing that he that he had told me that probably stuck with me even to this day was uh, I, I remember I went up and I introduced my art piece, the little thing that he wanted us to do, which was to tell a story within one picture and then you know put that on the screen. So I decided to have one photo that I did and I put it up there or a picture. He, one thing that he said was that it's not legible. It, you can't be able to, you don't understand what's going on. Like, where is everything at? I, I know there's trees, but there's not, you know, and, and I think if that still resonates uh, with him, if, if that's very important is where not only is learning the fundamentals an important thing, but also um, should art students still learn about um, having clarity in their photos, um, is that also important in finding the quote unquote style as well? Um, also, that love your podcast, Trashman. I've been listening to you every episode. Um, thank you. So the question was for me. Yeah, I didn't really understand the question. I think it was about how important clarity is in, in a photograph. In that's it, what I heard in a photograph. If it's who I think it is, okay. uh, his, his priority is to be a visual storyteller. Mm -hmm. And when he put work up, the first issue was it's hard to read this picture. I have to look at it and think about it for a long time. And one of the first priorities certainly is clarity. In fact, 
Richard Williams said that it was the first priority. And Frank and Ollie in their book, The Illusion of Life, talking about the history of Disney animation, said that they worked to make a pose look natural, but also to make it read really clearly and quickly in silhouette. Cinematographers have cared about this a lot. It's not that you always do that, but if you don't do that, then you put the viewer in a position where they have to think more than they should want to think so that they can follow the story. Uh, that's why clarity comes first. And when I train visual storytellers, they have a whole week in a semester, there is one whole week to go through every frame and ask, can this be misinterpreted? Can it be misread? And if it can be, to do the work that it takes, like Walt Disney talked about, don't have somebody eating a sandwich in front of their face, because then you've got a foreshortening thing that makes it so that it reads complexly. Get it out to the side so that it reads in silhouette. That isn't a rule. There are times when deliberate ambiguity strengthens a work, but it's deliberate ambiguity and not just the sloppiness of never, I, I never thought whether this picture could be read by an audience quickly. Okay, so what's he asking? Is how it, Marshall pointed out, the first thing he pointed out when I put my work up is that it was hard to understand what was in the picture. I had to stop and think. Okay. So, you, and you told him that it's important that there's instant clarity in the picture. It is typically important mm -hmm. until it becomes a device. Howard mm. Pyle and N.C. Wyeth were great at making the silhouettes, silhouettes read that quickly. They were also great at hiding things. Mm. Arthur Rackham was a master at hiding something. You'd look at the composition, you wouldn't even notice the main thing until you looked around. Beatrix Potter, same thing. Okay. Where you, you have to find it. You have to do a little work yeah. to get they're it. They're doing this deliberately. They're showing you things that they want you to see immediately. Yeah. And they're choosing those as those things that they yeah. want you to see immediately. And then they're hiding things intentionally that they want you to see later as you observe. Yes. And you wouldn't believe how many times visual storytelling students will put frames out there and when you try to read them, here's the game you play. Pretend like you're showing this to an 11 year old or even a six year old. And they've got to look at these pictures and figure out what's going on in the story. And you don't get to tell them anything. Can they look picture to picture and tell what's going on? And if they can't, is there a reason? And of course, in many cases, you can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. And that means the visual storyteller, the artist, did not do the work and is expecting the audience to do it. Yeah. And it's always more work than most people think. Some people have a knack for it. They just know how to tell a story. They know what, where to put the camera. They know how to make it clear. Yeah. But all of the artsy stuff you can do, that there's a visual metaphor, or a hidden meaning to this picture, I've got the characters separated because they're emotionally separated, all of that stuff has to come after things have been clarified. So it's about control of clarity, not necessarily making everything clear, yeah. but making sure that you are in control of what is clear and what is not. Yeah. It's not just a visual storyteller's problem either, but it's mainly a visual storyteller's problem because they... Yeah. audience has a certain amount of time to register the content of the image and so the master visual storyteller is aware of that and orchestrating how long it should take okay. typically to read quickly how do we so do the answer is yes you still believe in that i do believe in it <laughs> nice hi my name is lily and i live in southern california and i wanted to know what y'all's uh, advice was on building an artistic community or groups as a good way of sort of checking each other and helping everyone progress towards their artistic goals. Or if there's any, um, and I guess if there's any good art classes in SoCal for a traditional minded artist. And I hope I reached the right number. And I really love the Draftman podcast. It's awesome. Okay, bye-bye. Building communities. Building communities. I'm guessing opinion. she's talking about like groups of people near you to meet up and draw together that kind of community i think uh, maybe or maybe classes i'm not sure but speaking of socal i try to hang out in the places where <laughs> where can she find you uh i <laughs> i teach at uh the junior college uh, fullerton junior college in fullerton on the one on chapman not the cal state university of fullerton but fullerton college i'm there at least once a week teaching classes, and I love that community. And uh, I mm -hmm. teach up at CDA, teach at Brainstorm Inland. 
these are places I, yeah. I mean I try to hang around with students who are creating community yeah so that's the local pitch Hi, this is Marshall. If you want to master traditional pen and ink, I'll host a one-night crash course in materials and techniques at Cura Studios October 29th. I'll show you everything you need to get started, and we will look at examples of great masters of steel pens. And Carol and Peters will follow it up with four Tuesday nights devoted to tree portraits in traditional media. If you are in or around Orange County, join us to connect with the Cura art community. Seating is limited. Go to curaoc.com to reserve your place in the workshop. Hope to see you there. Yeah, well, that's like Orange County area, and yeah, right? Is. That that's one part of SoCal. San Diego, there's Watatelier. That's the place I went to. Mm -hmm. um, do you know LA ones? Yeah, Concept Design Academy is one. Oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. cool. And okay. Inland Empire, uh, uh, Brainstorm Inland. Okay, perfect. Well, there's those. But what about if you want to? If you're in an area where there is no community, no good school, how do you build it? How do you build your own? Well, that's a big, big, question. a big question, and I have seen it done very well, and have even been part of it being done well, and I've seen it done very badly, because it's just like, how do you make good relationships happen? There's a lot to it, but let's see, if I was going to categorize, I'd say there tend to be the fellow travelers where everybody's working on the same thing. Seems like you had that at Watts, where everybody's working yeah. toward... Very similar goals. We're all doing the same thing. Then the other extreme is where everybody's doing different things, different disciplines, different skills, which is kind of what you have here. But one person is more technically oriented. One person does the cameras. You told me that it's going to be Brandon that will do the photography stuff with because he knows cameras so well. Another person is doing a lot of the editing. So you've got people who've got different things. I'm the drawer. I'm the story idea person. I'm the one who does the dialogue. Well, that's more of a team. Yeah, it's a that's team. team building versus community building, right? It is. But I think a team is a community and you've... Yes. Yeah. But a team is a type of community. A community isn't a type of team. Am I breaking it down correctly? Uh, yeah, community is not necessarily a team. Yeah. Right, right. But a team would be a community. Mm -hmm. It's as complicated as the ingredients, at least. There are some teams that might work until you get the one Machiavellian person in there that will, will throw it all off. There are people whose energy comes together to cooperate. There are people who their competi competitive uh, energy can create trouble or can create benefit. So it's... It's, there, I don't know that there's any simple answer for it, except that it is creative, it's compositional. I will make some recommendations. In fact, I don't know whether this will come out in time. The junior college in Fullerton let me write, I've written a total of, I think, 14 semester courses there over the last 30 some years. And one of them is called Genre and Style in Entertainment Art. I had taught it online uh, for a bit at TAD, but now we've got it as a semester of course. I've taught it once, I'm going to teach it again. The whole point of the class is to look at the the big world of the genre you're interested in. It may be science fiction and fantasy, it may be, it could be uh, dragon art, it could be comic books specifically, it could be adventure comics, whatever. Mm -hmm. And to study that genre or that arena and to in the first half of the semester for your report at midterm to whine about it. What I know this genre really well. Here's what I think it's got missing in it. And then in the second half of the semester to essentially write your Wikipedia entry for 20 years from now about how the genre evolved because of what you contributed to the genre. That you fixed this. This is Alan Moore's approach to uh, in his writing for comics, find something you're dissatisfied. Get to know it with and then uh, find something you're dissatisfied with and then evolve it, change it. Then the next thing is, there was research done by Gallup on teams and, or on, on strengths. They tried to see how many personality strengths can you identify, like ideation, diplomacy, anything that you could, some people have the gift of woo. What kind of strengths do you have? And so one week's assignment is to go through that list of those strengths and see which ones do I think are my three or five strongest and which are my three or five weakest. And then I think it was uh, Peter Drucker uh, who said that the thing that's great about a team is that everybody's strengths become maximized and their weaknesses become irrelevant because someone else can be that spoke in the wheel. 
And that might be a test for whether you've got a good community uh, possibility or not. Go through the strengths finders, uh, put out to your, peer, your potential comrades that here I, th- I think my uh, weaknesses, here are my, my strengths, see how they agree or disagree with them. And you might learn a lot, but you also might find just in, in how you tag each other for your strengths and weaknesses, how well you get along. Okay. That's, that's one, I mean, this, this could be a long topic, but that's one thing that if you're getting involved with a community, mm-hmm. you do, everybody does play a role. I think if you're creating a community, if you're trying to create this group of people that you meet up with regularly to help you on your journey, um, I think someone has to provide the environment. Where, where do you meet up? Um, so, and someone has to provide other resources or things that are required. Like, for example, if, you, if you're if you into life drawing, someone has to hire the models and uh, provide benches and stuff like that um, in order for this to even exist. So if, if you're willing to take on that role, that could be a big hurdle that you're solving for your community. Um, and that, that will attract people to come and hang out with you. Yeah, go ahead. It's an you're, attitude of con- contribution, too. Yeah. yeah you, if you're trying to create a group of people who are worth hanging out with, you need to offer something. Um, you, you, they need a reason to come hang out with you. Yeah, you, your personality, your knowledge can be that contribution, but they don't know that until they actually start hanging out with you and get to know you. Yeah. So at first, you need to give people a reason to... Uh, to hang out with you like hey we have a free model or a model just pitch in two dollars come draw or hey meet up at the local bar have a drink and have fun and ske- bring your sketchbook and we're just gonna have fun and we're artists and we'll talk that could also be a thing you don't have to pay for a, a place and a model you can just meet up at a lounge and, and sketch um, but there's something in it for everybody uh, Lily, there's been research done on this. In fact, the Great Courses, I think, has at least one course, that uh, more than one course on this kind of thing. But Michael Dew's course on uh, conflict management cites quite a bit of research of what makes people get along better and not. And it's, it can get complicated where you uh, break it down into goals and motivations and, and uh, emotions and all of the literal components, like the elements of art. There are elements that are involved in having community work. So it may be worth studying, but sometimes people who don't know anything about it intellectually, they just play well with others. Yeah. So as I don't know I, if she wants to study the this intellectually. I think she just wants some like action items, some advice to get a community started. Yes. Well, there here is one reason though to to study it because there's no way that they're gonna you're gonna have four or five people get together and everything's gonna go smoothly. And so to understand right. a little bit about group dynamics, and that's where you have to have a team mom. Yeah. Hopefully, some the person or hopefully you can have this be a healthy environment where people can trust that they, they'll go and they won't be judged. And um, I mean, you can be, you can critique each other, but you're not going to be judged in, the, in a unhealthy way and you're not yeah. going to be insulted. And that is a healthy environment where you can come and you can grow and you can help each other. But somebody has to lead that, like you're saying, and so, someone who understands, I think, um, uh, who understands people needs to be in charge of this. Yeah. There's some people, some that have no gift for people, but they are great contributors to a team because they will disappear and do the work. Uh, All of this is to say, I think it's beyond our scope of trying to simplify what will make the community work. And it may, may be beyond your question of what you really cared about, except to say that if it's working great, if you've got several friends, as happens sometimes, I think in Anne of Green Gables, she met when they, when you, sometimes when you're young, you meet another kid and you just immediately become fast friends yeah. and, and you're, uh, you're a team. Uh, whereas w- often it doesn't happen that way and it doesn't really take intellect so much as it takes instinct to know with this person I need to be more mm-hmm. assertive, with this person I need to be uh, more malleable. So if it works, great. I can't tell you in any simple thing, in any simple way, 
how to make it work, except that I've seen a lot that haven't worked and a lot that yeah. have. Um, and then as far as how do you find that friend, and it, it, I think it should grow naturally. Like start with a few people, figure out what you guys want, and then it'll kind of grow from there based on what everybody in that group wants. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to make it official, you can go on like meetup.com and you can post a thing and then mm -hmm. people meet up with you if, if there's enough people around your area. But if, I think if you just know one person that will go and do this thing with you, then maybe word of mouth, you guys could get slowly get more people to join and and it'll become what you all want it to become. Mm -hmm. um, in my life, it happens more than anything else in classrooms just because I spend so much time in classrooms. That's a natural yeah. starting point. Students, they already have a, a common interest. Right. Yeah. Cool. So thank you guys for sending the voicemails. I had fun. Yeah. Doing a, a pure voicemail episode. We should I'm do this again. I'm glad we did this, yeah. It was a little more relaxing. I didn't have to prepare for anything. Yeah. We're going to move on to some things. Okay. Stan. I got a good one. What's your thing? I finished reading a book. Yeah. Actually, I listened to it. Okay. I like to say reading it because it makes me sound smarter. Okay. You know? But I know. <laughs> if I listened to it, it's like... I still think you're smart. As if I don't know how to read. No, it's okay. It's I know okay. you know how. Yeah. You're secure. The whole, the whole audiobook thing is a, is a new thing that people still, from your generation, don't know about, right? Let me, let me give you the 20-second answer. Oh, Jesus. I'm sorry I said that. There used to be books on tape. <laughs> oh, you're right. I'm an idiot. Yeah, I got into We're those. We're cutting that so, part out. Yeah, yeah what that's a, a... That's a millennial comment right there. Idiot. I thought I was insulting your generation and I, just, I was just insulting myself <laughs> with my ignorance. Yeah, you sure were. <laughs> Let's move right on as if it didn't happen. <laughs> okay, so I finished listening to The Art of Learning. I mentioned it in a previous episode mm -hmm. because I thought, I really thought someone needed it. I think it was Jeremy... No, no, it wasn't no, no, it was Ra Raphael. Raphael. Yeah. He, yeah, I mentioned it to him. Art of Learning by Josh Waitskin. He is the subject of Searching for Bobby Fischer. Mm -hmm. He's the movie about the child prodigy for, ch for chess. So he was the actual kid that got really good at chess at a really young age. Um, and I think at around like 20 ish, he stopped playing chess professionally and he went on to do, um, he went on to martial arts and he got really good at that. He's a world champion at that as well. And I think around that time he started seeing um, similarities between learning how to play chess as a kid and learning martial arts as an adult. And he started connecting it and he started formulating these theories of how to learn. Um, and that's what this book was about. It's about how to reach mastery and how to perform at such high levels. Can you synopsize a few of the major points? I can try. Or even if you just take out some of the things that made a dominant impression. Yes. So, uh, one of the things in the beginning was that really made a big impact on me probably because I have a son, was um, how parents really determine a really big part of how good their child, how good of a learner their child becomes. And that is they they fall into one of two groups the child either uh, associates their successes and their failures with talent like if someone is a good dancer the parents reward them for being good at dancing hmm. like oh you're such a good dancer or man you you have such a knack for drawing you're so gifted at this you get it yeah. right they they don't give the child credit for it they, they give nature credit for yeah, this. They, that's a, this. the talent and the nature versus nurture or the growth mindset versus fixed mindset thing. Yes. And the other side of it is they don't focus on that talent at all. They just say, wow, you worked so hard and you, your dance performance was so good because you worked so, so hard to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. They focus on the work. They focus on what it took to get there. Even if they are naturally were more gifted at it, mm -hmm. they don't focus on that. They just focus on the work that it takes. Yeah. And so the child associates success with hard work instead of associating success with an, a thing that just happens to them. Yeah. And that's a huge thing that I got from the book. 
I've heard this from educational theory too, that it's always been, Don Richardson used to, when people did work, he'd say, you're good, you're talented. And I never doubted when he said that, that he was speaking from great insight about having seen how talented people work. But the newest wisdom is to pull the attention away from whether you're good, you're talented, to the kind of commitment you made to carrying through with the work because then you're praising the thing. That's the, those are the embers to blow on to get the fire going, mm -hmm. not to just compliment what you were given, but compliment what you brought to it. Yeah. And it's not just associating success with hard work. It's also that they're, uh, they're a lot better at recovering from failure when they have that mentality mm -hmm. because they, they don't, when they fail, they don't think, oh, I am bad. They associate it with the work. They think, oh, I probably could have prepared better. Yeah. And they don't feel bad about themselves. They don't associate themselves as failures anymore. Um, so that's huge because when you think of yourself as a failure, it's debilitating. You might just stop and quit. And a huge part of getting good at something is just not quitting. You just yeah. keep going and keep, keep improving. That's been a big theme in our discussions. Is the uh, I don't know who originated the term fixed mindset and growth mindset. Do you? No, I don't. If we find out who it is, we should probably post it. But yeah, I was only introduced to that uh, in about 2010, 2011, when Dorian Eaton did a presentation on the difference between the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And the fixed mindset says, "I was never any good at that. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm not good at that. Yeah. Therefore, I've." Uh, absolve myself of any responsibility to work on it. Right. Yeah. And the fic the growth mindset says, I like that enough to where I think I will get good at it. And it makes a choice and takes responsibility. Yeah. So that's one thing. He talks about being um, getting good at being in the soft zone. What's the soft zone? It's a mental state where dis distractions don't bother you. So you're like a, bl a leaf uh, or a, a blade of grass the wind just makes you bend and then you come back and you, you, you blow with the wind. You don't blow away or you don't break. So basically dealing with distractions. He, he was talking about, and this is more of a performance thing, I think, not learning, but they're associated. Mm -hmm. um, so he was talking about how when he was in a competition, a lot of competitors, you know, chess competitors would try to distract them with like some tapping or mm -hmm. kick them under the table. Mm -hmm. And that would instantly put him in a, in a zone of, you know, he would be mad at them and that would just break his whole game and he would lose just because he was distracted. And so being able to not be bothered by that mm -hmm. allowed him to perform better. He was soft. And then another, the next stage of that is to actually learn how to use that to your advantage. Like how? I don't remember. <laughs> okay. But use to use, I go to use distractions part. to your advantage, you mean? Or to use yes. this? Yeah. yeah. I know that one of the things he mentioned was that when people would try to distract him or like he went in martial arts, they would headbutt him when the, when like the, the referee wasn't watching and he just didn't let it bother him and he would actually just smile at the opponent and, and just be extra nice to them afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that would get into the opponent's head like, what? And so that pisses off the person who headbutted, hmm. and then that gets them into the the zone of of frustration. Huh. So he's using it to his using advantage. I think that was one of the examples he gave. Yeah. Um. So that that's more of a one on one thing, an example for one on one, but it could be applied to, uh, you know, art where you're a solo performer. Okay. Yeah. Anything there, else? There's so much. There is so there's much. So much. I don't know if I should get. We could do a full episode on this if if you want to. If you ever read the book, maybe we could. I would love to could. read the book. Um, you had me read the Talent Code yeah. alongside with you a few years ago, and that had a big a effect on me. Too. We could do an episode on the Talent yeah. Code. I want to reread that one as well. Yeah, I want to reread it too. Oh, stress and recovery was another big one in that. Tell us. So. When you're performing, let's say you, you're going for eight hours, you're working hard, and then you know that the, tomorrow you're gonna have to do it again, and you have another hard day ahead of you, you need to make sure that you have a big enough period of recovery um, because you're not gonna perform well. So right. he, he talked a lot about just being good at recovery. 
And any, any little hints about what help us, what will help us be good at recovery? And timing it is what you just mentioned. Well, time is is a good one, but it's not just time. It's figuring out what will help you recover, creating a routine for yourself to get back into the zone, and also just being aware when you need to recover. He was talking about in chess where there were certain moves that he would spend 15 minutes on thinking about. And after that, his brain was so exhausted that he would falter afterwards. So he would need to notice when he wasn't thinking clearly anymore and just take five minutes of not thinking about anything and just recover and come back or go outside, run up the stairs, come back down that, um, that aerobic uh, qual- the, you know, a little bit of exercise, getting mm-hmm. your lungs going, your heart going, would bring that mental clarity back. He comes back, sits down, washes his face. Mm-hmm. Things like that would help him bring, come back. Just being aware when you need to recover. Yeah. And he, he, this is stuff he figured out out of his own experience. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Eddie O'Connor in The Psychology of Performance has a chapter on burnout and the need for recovery. It's a really sobering chapter because burnout is a, an, a real technically designated condition that can be very difficult to recover from. So he talks in there about the stages of burnout. These have been studied, the ways to protect from it uh, in the stages, ways to recover from it. But that chapter is -hmm. is worthwhile to anyone who feels like they're headed toward or who's going into a profession. Yeah. Like they're going to be a surgeon or they're going to be something where it's 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 they're famous for burnout. Yeah. to be to know about it in advance. So he is speaking from his own experience how to maximize when yeah. you've worked really hard at something how to bounce back from it. Yeah. And I think a lot of it isn't just like the obvious like yeah go get some sleep. It's um being aware of your mental state at any given moment, being being self-conscious in a good way. Um and being honest with yourself when you need to just take a break. Like in yoga where they say, listen to your body. Yeah. Just pay attention. And Yeah, being and, good at reading your body yeah. um, and feeding it. Yeah, what great. It, what it needs. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, but it's it's a good read. That's my thing. Well, that sounds like a worthy thing. Yeah. Thang. Thang. Sorry. Thang. I'm going to do that for the next hundred years. <laughs> Did you have a thing yet? I, you... you prompted me to one. Okay, cool. This, like Bullets Over Broadway, is another 1990s. It might even be the same year, 1994. This is a film by a first-time director, Boaz Yakin. He had written, he'd written, I think, a movie for Clint Eastwood, and this is his first time directing. It is an unknown and underrated film called Fresh. It has almost no stars in it except Samuel Jackson, who has a small part in it, who plays Fresh's dad. I will warn you in advance, it is rated R for brutal violence. You should know that and steer away from it if that's going to bother you. I will tell you as a story, you do not want to know the story points because it is a corker of a story and uh, not a high production uh, value uh, film, but a really well directed film, film to tell the story. And the reason I mention it is that this kid, in his relationship with his dad, it's very much based on chess and chess mm. strategies. And one of the things it showcases is that the strategy for one thing might not be the strategy for another thing. So even just as a case study in how you get good at something, how you may be good at one at something uh, that is slow motion, like Pink Floyd was great at all of the engineering that went into those albums. But then you're gonna find that other people Christopher Parkening or Andrew Segovia, they just pick up their instrument and they play an entire uh, concert. They're two very different things, even though they're both music. Some people are better at the slow motion thing. Some people are better at the fast motion thing. Whatever you're better at, you should probably study the other or practice the other. But then you figure you're going to run with your showcase with the thing that you, you are. Uh, that reminds me of another at. point from the book. Yeah, go, go ahead. Because that, 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 that's just my thing. I warn you against it. But Fresh is a film that I very much like. Very satisfying film. He has a, um, I think, a full chapter on slowing down time. Tell us. So you know how people talk about like very key moments in their life when something dramatic happened and they saw things in slow motion, mm-hmm. like a like a car accident or, or something. You know, something just just like pauses time because or not pauses, but slows it down, and they're seeing things 
yeah so it doesn't actually slow down time right your brain just catches more details yeah. in that moment and so it feels slower to you because of how much information your brain captured in that moment and so he kind of uses that to talk about how some people can get so good at something practice every frame of an action that it's almost like slowing down time in martial arts this can apply i mean quite literally when uh, a certain maneuver is executed there's like a, a choice every like half millisecond that they could make uh that could leave in a different direction and if they've perfected every of those every one of those paths they can almost slow down time because they're so good at the instinct am i explaining this yes, did, did you, i, I did feel you like see, i'm blabbering did, no did you see <laughs> did you see guy ritchie's sherlock holmes movies the two sherlock holmes and and uh and a is game that of the shadows. one on Netflix? It's, the one it, that has like five episodes? No, no, no. This is this is not TV. These are movies. Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law played uh, Holmes and Watson. Oh, I think so. I you think know, I did. I didn't see the the first one because people said you like to Sherlock Holmes too much, you'll be upset. It's not what, Cumberbatch. No, no, no. This was for the movies. This was okay. Uh, but uh, when the second one came out, people said you should see this. This is a this is a worthwhile movie. And I saw it, and then saw it again, and saw it again, and then went back to. I love those movies, even if they are cotton candy. Uh, but they have a portion in there that no, I've never seen anybody do, where Holmes, at the beginning, looks at the scenario that he's going to fight in, and goes through it in his mind in slow motion yes and, and then it, acts it out and it was just i just love watching those scenes it, it makes you feel like you could be a genius that's a really good visual i think i have seen that mm -hmm. uh maybe in the in cumberbatch has that same scene mm -hmm. but that's a very good visualization of what's actually happening is because he has trained his brain to pick up on all these clues so quickly that it's it's more of an instinct he doesn't mm -hmm. actually have to look for them. Yeah. And so for us, for a normal person, it would take hours to do what he just did in yeah. two seconds. Yeah. And so it's like slowing down time. That whole thing about slowing down time is really interesting. And yeah. also the, the opposite of it, that we don't want to just use the technology to take something that happens fast and slow it down on film so we can see the individual droplet of water make all the waves. We also want to take something that takes a long time, like a tree growing or a flower blossoming, and make it happen quickly so that we get a macro view of how things happen. So that's where you step back. Uh, Charles and Ray Eames did a film called Powers of Ten, where Charles Eames was big on get up over it and see the great big context, get down into it because God is in the details and it's both. Yeah. So those, okay, you've certainly convinced me on so taking a whole things. episode to talk about the Josh Waitzkin book and, yeah. and unpack this stuff. Another thing that he, uh, for recording it, he, uh, he recorded him and his martial arts partner. Um, they, they got to such a high level together that they didn't really even know why some things worked anymore because mm -hmm. they knew each other so well. Mm -hmm. that sometimes something happened and all and one of them just threw down the other one yeah and they're like yeah i have no idea what like how that one worked and then and they would record it slow it down and see you know fr certain frames and what happened and then they would be like oh okay that's what happened and then they would practice that specific thing yeah isn't that exciting i mean it's, yeah. it's thrilling it makes you feel like there there is a way to get better and better and better to where you just you come up to a level that's yeah. beyond what you imagine slowly just fine-tuning every little element to the point where you don't even understand what's happening mm -hmm. your brain is just making decisions that you don't understand and then you film that and you analyze that and then you make that into something you understand and you keep practicing until your brain gets even better yes it, yeah this is about human potential yes. you know it's it, that's, it that's exactly. what makes it so exciting is that i can be way better than i thought i could be yeah i'd like to throw out a question to the viewers okay. and listeners stan has brought up the subject of devoting an episode to synopsizing josh waitkin's Waitskin. Waitskin's Wait. book, yeah. The Art of Learning. That kind of interests me to have a whole podcast on it or okay. maybe things and other resources that cluster around it. Yeah. I would love to do that with a few things, uh, some of these great courses. Uh, I don't know what about the legalities are, but if you are interested in having podcasts devoted to some one thing, one course, one 
uh, book report, so to speak, and give the main points and opinions and a little bit. If that interests you, let us know uh, because we've talked about it. We haven't really been sure whether we should devote an entire podcast to a subject. I think we should once we have something that we're interested, like really interested in. But the art of learning is one of them. It's definitely one of them. And earlier uh, in a previous episode, we talked about the George Leonard's book, Mastery. Yes. Um, and also you brought up, um, gosh, the the great course, Psychology, Psychology of Performance. Psychology of Performance. I bought that one. I started listening yeah. to it. Once I finish it, don't know when I will, but yeah. once I do, we could we could do it on that one as well. I'd love to do it on that one. That I lived in that one for two months and it was just it was so rich with uh, research. Mm-hmm. And and also, it, it's like the human potential thing, just so exciting to think that you really can get better and better at something if you are going about it the right way. Yeah. Right now, I started re-listening to uh, How to Make Friends and Influence People. Daryl Carnegie? Yeah. Yeah. It's a classic. Yeah, it's a classic. It's a good one to re-listen to every once in a while. Very anecdotal, very... Uh, I, I remember, yeah, it's, it's, I feel like the world would be a better place if everybody knew what it was that he had to say about How many times have you read that one? I've, I, I have been exposed to it since my childhood and I read it when I was younger and then spent years uh, feeling guilty for not having uh, applied it. But I've tried to revisit it recently. But I feel like you're a, a living example of a lot of those rules. Oh, well, that's my mom. That wasn't something I consciously <laughs> oh, really? learned. No, my mom just was... Uh, oh, in God. fact, when, when I told you about my mom one time, it was Comic-Con last year, and I was describing what she was like. You kept saying, that's like you. That's like I was describing yeah. all, all of her virtues. I was thinking, oh, you didn't know my mom. Yeah, okay. She was... Uh, yeah, she, she just had... Uh, she was just really a, an appreciator and celebrator of people. And I don't feel I'm that, like I'm that way, but it's because I'm comparing myself to Eleanor. Your mom. Yeah. Okay, are cool. we done? I think so. Cool. Well, thank you guys for listening. Yes. And watching. Please give us five stars on iTunes. Sponsor this episode. And leave a comment below of what? Again, what was it again? What would you, yeah, would you, would you want podcasts entirely devoted to a book report or a course report? Or give us some ideas. Yeah. Things that you really want. Yeah.